turn to romance and homes are divided feelings that should never have been awakened within tearing the heart in two listen I beg of you guard your Shall we rise up, please? 
I want you to just talk to the Lord. That as the word of God comes to you now, that the Lord himself will speak his word to your heart. Let's tell the Lord that the Lord himself will speak his word to our hearts. You want to tell the Lord that as you come into his presence tonight, the Lord, I mean this morning, the Lord himself will open your heart to receive the best from his word. The choir has sang to us, we need to guide our hearts. So that we don't lose it for the things, for the treasures of this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we just come before you again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That as we come before your word, you will break this bread of life to us, Lord. Father, speak your word to our heart, Lord. Help us, Lord, that we not be dull of hearing, but that what you are telling us today, we will do this, Lord. The watchfulness that is required of us as Christians, so that we don't lose the treasures of Christ in us, Lord, give us that grace in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because you have had an answer. Help us, Lord, that we be attentive to your word. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning in our Sunday service, we are considering the message titled, The Watchfulness of the Righteous. The Watchfulness of the Righteous. And it's a message that speaks to me and also speaks to every one of us. I want to encourage every one of us that we all be attentive. We come, we allow solemnity so that we can get the best from the word of God. Because it's a message that your reaction to a message like this could determine where you will spend your eternity. It's a warning that the Lord is giving to his church. It's a warning that the Lord is giving to us at a time like this, so that we don't lose all that the devil has in us. And my prayer is that the Lord himself will help every one of us, that we'll get the best from this word of God today in Jesus' name. We'll see the examples of some men that started well, but a time of carelessness we allowed into their life. And they lost the things that the Lord has deposited in them. Some of, some of them were able to recover those things. But some of them, unfortunately, they couldn't recover themselves back. They are now spending their eternity in everlasting damnation and condemnation. But my prayer for you, you know, this Christian race is not just to start the race that matters. It's not just to say, oh, I am a Christian. I raise, I gave my life to Christ that matters. It is to continue the race to the very end. And my prayer is that we all continue this race to the very end in Jesus' name. Genesis chapter 7. Don't give that thing to that baby again. Genesis chapter 7, I will read from verse 1 of Genesis chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, 
For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. For thee have I seen righteous. Here was the testimony of God concerning Noah. God himself declared Noah to be righteous. Here was the declaration of the Almighty God that Noah was a righteous man. He was not just only righteous, but Noah was uniquely righteous. That in the midst of the corrupt millions of people at the world at that time that live in his own generation, God declared Noah as righteous in his own generation. Not only was Noah declared to be righteous, do you know that the New Testament even called Noah a preacher of righteousness? Open your Bible to Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 5. And spare not the whole war, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Noah was not only called righteous, but God himself called him righteous. He did not only call him righteous, the Bible, the New Testament, called Noah to be a preacher of righteousness. Not only that he was righteous, he wanted others around him. He wanted others before the floor. He wanted them to partake in his righteousness. He was declared to be righteous. He was not only righteous, he was also a preacher, a proclaimer a defender of righteousness in his own generation. But in the subsequent events that happened in the life of Noah, something unfortunately right, uh, you know, disappointing, unfortunate and disappointing happened in the life of this man, this righteous man, Noah. A man that was declared to be righteous by faith. A man that was declared to be righteous by the grace of God. A man that was declared to be a preacher of righteousness. Both in the Old and in the New Testament. Turn out, do you know, to be a drunkard in the Bible. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. From verse 20 of Genesis chapter 9. And Noah began to be an husband man. And he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunken. Do you see that? He drank of the wine and was drunken. And he was uncovered within his tent. And Am, the father of Cain, saw the nakedness of his father. And told his two brethren without. Noah drank of the wine and was drunken. Here was the first statement. Here was the first word of that word drunken, drunken in the Bible. Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Noah, a man declared to be righteous. Noah, a man, a proclaimer of righteousness, be, became a drunkard. What a lesson for us as Christians. That being righteous today does not immune you from the temptation of falling into sin tomorrow. That's why we need to be careful. That's why we need to be watchful. That's why we need to live our life. With eternity in view. You know, from this passage of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 9, there are seven lessons I want us to bring out from this, from this experience of Noah. Number one, it's not there in the slide. Noah was unfamiliar and undesigning with wine. Wine was never mentioned in the Bible before this time. This was the first mention of, of wine. And for Noah, it was a new experience. 
And for Noah, it was, it was not familiar with it. Because the Bible says, And Noah began to be an husbandman. And he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine. That's the first mention of that, one, of that word wine in the Bible. For, 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 for Noah, he was unfamiliar and undesigning with, with wine. Number two, you see that the action of Noah at this time was unpremeditated and unintentional. He never, he never premeditated, uh, premeditated in his heart. No, he never. Unlike the drunkard we have today, people will say, oh, well, uh, Noah was a drunkard, but he went to heaven. But you need to understand that this action of Noah was not a premeditated act. I don't know people that say, oh, they want to go to the bar today. They have planned it. They have premeditated it. Their action is intentional. That they are going there to drink, uh, to drink alcohol. But for Noah, it was unpremeditated and unintentional. But do you know that this act of Noah led him to be unwise and unwatchful? Noah at this time was unwise, a man of righteousness, a man that God singled him out, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives, singled the eight of them out, 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 out of the millions of people that were destroyed by the flood, and say, oh, Noah and his family, they were preserved from the flood. A preacher of righteousness, but this action of Noah at this time led him to be unwise and unwatchful. That's why we need to be careful with our Christian experiences. We've read it in number 4. We've read it in verse 4. In verse 21, Noah was uncovered, unclothed, and unconscious. That's what wine does. Strong drink, alcohol, that's what it does into the life of people. The drunkard of today, you see many of them, they're unconscious. You see them on the street, on Friday, on Union Street. They're unconscious of their behavior. Some of them, if you are driving, you know, most times if you are coming from a power night and prayer vigil, if you are driving and you are not careful, you see some of these drunkards, they'll just, you know, run onto the road carelessly because they're unconscious. Some of them uncovered. Even in the time of snow, winter period, you see some of them, and that many of them, they've lost their life like that because the unconsciousness, unconsciousness of the cold, of the freezing condition around them has led to the death of many drunkards today. And for Noir, it was not an exception. Number five, it was undignified and unhonored. Noir, at this time, he lost his dignity as a preacher of righteousness. He lost his dignity. The same thing, when you go into this scene of drunkenness, when you go into this scene of alcoholism, it makes you undignified. You see many drunkards, you know, drunkards today, they've lost their dignity because of alcohol, because of drunkenness. And the same thing happened to Noah. But do you know, one good thing we learn from this, from this passage, do you know that none of his sons, None of his sons, they copied their father. That's why Noah, he was unimitated and uncopied. Unimitated and uncopied. His sons never learned from him. That their father was a drunkard, they also became a con. No, they never, they never copied their father because it was not a good example. In fact, Am, he had to even go and tell the other brothers and say, Come and see our father, unclothed, uncovered in his nakedness. They never copied for me. What an example for us as children of God. We don't copy bad examples. Anything you cannot defend in the word of God, you don't copy it. You don't say, oh, no matter the person that does that thing, it could be a Christian, it could be a preacher, it could be a preacher of righteousness, so to say. You don't know that that thing he has done, you know, is something that is undignified and unhonored. We don't copy that out, but that we don't say, oh, because that preacher did that, he, copied, he did that thing, me try, we do it. Be careful, be careful. 
Any example that has no foundation in the word of God, we don't copy. But do you know, Noah, despite his experience, he was unflinching, unwavering, and unswerving. You never see Noah again go back to take that wine. You never see the account after this you know, experience of Genesis chapter 9 from verses 20 to 21. You never see it in the Bible that Noah was ever called a drunkard again. No wonder the New Testament, the last testimony of him, about, the, about him in the New Testament was that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And do you know what? When you mention people like Daniel, do you know that Noah was also mentioned like, you know, in that means, Noah, Daniel, and who? And who? I'm asking a Bible student. Eh? Oh, you, you've not seen it in the Bible. Okay, I'm giving you the assignment now. Go and find it out in Ezekiel. I, want to, I want to know those who read their Bible. And next week Sunday, I will ask you. Noah, I've given you two. I'm asking for the third person now. It's in the book of Ezekiel. I'm not going to mention it. Eh, eh, I don't want uh, guesswork here. Go and read the Bible. It was mentioned among these three righteous people. Daniel was one of them. And Noah was mentioned. The third person I will not mention is an assignment for you. I pray the Lord will help us. Noah fell into the sin of drunkenness. This is for, should be a warning to every heaven bound Christian. If you are saved today, you are born again today, be watchful. Don't live a careless life. Don't allow frivolity into your Christian life. Frivolity into your Christian life. Don't allow carelessness into your Christian life. We need to be careful. If someone like Noah, Noah that was called a righteous man by God, you know, for God to call somebody righteous, you know, like I was telling us on Friday at the revival service, that person is really righteous. Is that not so? And yet, for that righteous man, if uh, you will not fall. That's why we must take it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll read verses 11 and 12 of 1 Corinthians. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are waiting for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh is standard. Do what? Take it, let it fall. Those who have grace today, take it, let you fall. Don't say, oh, I'm 10 years in the Lord. I cannot fall. Take heed lest you fall. Let him that thinketh this stand. You think you are strong today. You think you are powerful today. You think you are a giant today. You think you are something today. Take heed lest you fall under the lap of the Delilah. Take heed. Take heed. In Matthew chapter 26... Look at the warning that Christ gave us. Matthew chapter 26. I will read from verse 41 of Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Watch and pray. It's not just watch alone. Watch and pray. It's not just pray alone. Going to the mountain top to pray with that watchfulness will not help you. Giving our days of prayer and fasting. And then you are not watching. You are not watching your habits. You are not watching your character. You are not watching your behavior. You are not watching your language. You are not watching your attitude. We not help you. Watch and pray. Those are twin things that Jesus gave us, our Lord and Savior. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Don't wait till you enter into temptation before you begin to pray. It says, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
Temptation will come. Don't wait until you fall into temptation before you begin to pray. Watch and pray that you fall not, that you enter not into temptation. Why did you say that? Because the Spirit indeed is willing. But what did you say? What did your Bible say? Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? Jesus. That's why I keep telling us, brethren, that you are born again. You are born again does not take away the flesh from you. You are born again does not take away your body from you. You are born again does not make you a lesser woman being or a better, a, a supernatural being. No! The Bible says that we are born of the water and born of the Spirit. Is that not what the Bible says? And the one himself that gets us born again, he tells us that, that we are born again, the Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's why, brother, we need to be careful. What we feed our flesh with, you need to be careful. What the things you give to the flesh, you need to be careful. Because Jesus himself said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh, the flesh will always be there. Until we get to heaven, there is no resting place. Until Jesus comes at the rapture, there is no resting place. Because the flesh will always fight against the spirit. That's why we need to watch. Watch and pray. Not pray alone. There are many prayer warriors today that fail to watch and they are nowhere to be found in the Christian faith. When I look at my life, when I look at the experiences, the number of years I've had with the Lord, have, you know, the people I've come in contact with, people that were strong, people that were, you know, when you look at it, so this one is, these are giants, how are the mighty falling and the weapons of war perishing. It is not prayer alone, it is watch and pray. And it is not watching alone, it is watch and pray. That ye enter not. Don't wait until the temptation comes before you begin to pray. Watch now. Pray now. That's what Jesus said. That you fall not into, you enter not into temptation. Watchfulness is very important, brethren. If we must make it at the end of these ways, and the Lord will help us. I say the Lord will help us. For better understanding quickly of our message this morning, we want to consider this under three up heading. Point one, the weakness of the righteous. The righteous people, they have weaknesses. Do you know that? The weakness of the righteous. I want to show you from the word of God that no matter how righteous you think you are, the righteous have weaknesses. That's why we need to take it. The weakness of the righteous. Point two, warnings for the righteous. Warnings for the righteous. Then point three, before we pray, the warfare of the righteous. The warfare of the righteous. But then we need to understand that we are made righteous by grace. It is not a quality or virtue that is inborn in us. Nobody comes Born of this war, born of a woman with righteousness in him. The only one that did that, the only one that has that, that is born of a woman who knew no sin, who did no sin, who has no sin, is our Lord and Savior. And after Jesus, there is no one else. Get that understanding into your heart now. That you are born again, it is by the grace of God. Don't say, oh, I'm, my parents are spiritual. My father, my mother, they are pastors. And as a result of that, I am born with righteousness. No! The only one that did that, because he was born of a woman without any 
activity of the man in that seed. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for the seed that is conceived of her is, of, is conceived of the Holy Ghost. It's the only one. That's why the Bible says, he knew no sin, he did no sin. So we are saved by grace. We are made righteous by grace. It is by grace we are saved. It is not by works. It is by grace. And without grace, do you know that we are as ordinary as other men and women in the society are there? The only thing that distinguishes us from the sinners out there is the grace of God. Without the grace of God, you are like them. It's the grace of God. Salvation, boldness at the throne of grace, conviction and uncompromising stand on the truth of the word of God are all by the grace of God. But do you know, do you know, brethren, that there are men of grace that fell into sin? Because the faith to understand that it is all by grace. It is all by grace. The faith to realize that it is all by grace. So as a result of that, you know, when you know your standing, when you know that all you have is by grace, that will make you to be more careful. Is that not so? Is that not so? Do you know that we as Christians, I don't know, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience before in your life that uh, for those of us who did the um, uh, National Youth Service something, you know, there is a walk that we walk, you do the walk in there. You walk on a thin line of rope. Have you done that kind of walking before? You walk on a thin line of rope. And if you miss the step, what happens to you? You just fall down. Do you know that that's how the Christian life is? We are walking by grace on a thin line of hope. And that thin line, that thin line is what I'm telling you today, that's the grace of God. That's why we need to be careful. The grace of God is the thin line we are walking on. And the more you fail to realize that, the more you don't be living a careless life, the more you don't be living a life, and you don't be saying, oh, well, uh, <laughs> God is love. You know, we were preaching yesterday, I was telling somebody, I said, yes, God is love. God loves you, but then you have your own responsibility also to accept the love of God, to appropriate the love of God into your heart. That's the thing like we are walking by grace. The weakness, that's why there is the weakness of the righteous. Open your Bible with me to Judges chapter 8. Let me show you the example of this man. Judges chapter 8. Look at the example of Gideon, a righteous man. Look at the example of Gideon, a man that became a judge of Israel all by the grace of God. But look at what happened in the, you know, the later part of this man. Judges chapter 8, from verse 22 of Judges chapter 8. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Who thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's sons also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Here was Gideon. The Lord used Gideon to deliver Israel from the Midian. And as a result of that, the whole Israelite came to Gideon. And so Gideon, not only you now, rule over us. Not only you, your sons also. Let them rule over us. Your sons' sons. To your third generation, let them rule over us. But look at what Gideon said. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord... The Lord shall do what? Shall rule over you. That thing he don't say, is it good or bad? Eh? If you stop there, you know, you say, oh, this man is righteous man. This man is a holy man. This man is a, you know, is a, is a man fit for heaven. But do you know? Look at verse 24. And Gideon said unto them, I will desire a request of you, that you will give me every man the earrings of his prey, 
For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread the garment, and they cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of silver, beside ornaments and colors and purple raiment that was on the king that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the shame, uh, the chains that were about their camel's neck. And Gideon made an offer thereof and put it in his city, even in opera. And all Israel went, a wo- went with her a warring after it, which thing became a snare to Gideon and to what? And to his house. Take it. We have not already, we have not finished the verse itself. We have not finished the chapter. We are still in chapter 28. I mean chapter 8. You have not finished the chapter of your life yet. Take heed, my brother. Take heed, my sister. Yet in verse 22, Gideon was a righteous man. In verse 23, Gideon gave all the glory to God. And said, oh, I will not rule over you. Only God will rule over you. From, but from verse 24 to verse 25, he took the glory that is of God and he took it upon himself. And that thing Gideon did displeased the Lord. Take it. Take it. You've not come to the end of the chapter of your life. Take it. Watch and pray. The weakness of the righteous. I've told us that we as the righteous, we are walking on a very thin line. And that thin line is the grace of God. The moment you miss that grace, you fall into sin. Take it. Let's you fall. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Let's see the example of another righteous man there. Second Chronicles chapter 15 verse 7. Be ye strong therefore, and let not your heart be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. I say your work shall be rewarded. I say your work shall be rewarded. But when Esa had these words and the prophecy of Ode the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the city which he has taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. He took away abominable all the idols. He took them away. That was King Asia. The, you know, the prophet came to him, gave him the word of encouragement. And when he heard that, he now went and began to destroy all the idols. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 15. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they are sworn with their heart, and sought him with their own desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. The Lord gave them rest. Do you know, brethren? Do you know, brethren, take it, take it. It is at the moment of rest that you can lose the grace of God. It is at the moment when things are going well for you. You have a good job, you have a house, you have everything going well for you. It's like now, there is no challenge. It's like now, there is no mountain to fight. There is no battle to fight. It is at that time you need to take it, my brother. It is at that time you need to take it, my sister. Like in Asia, at the moment of rest. But look at verse 16, verse 16, verse 7. Chapter 16, rather, chapter 16, verse 7. And at that time, King, uh, uh, and at that time, Ananiah, the seer, came to Asia, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou art rely on the king of Syria, and hast not rely on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thy hand. What did he do? Verse 15, a righteous man. But look at verse 16 now. Just one chapter after. Just one chapter. Now he had rest. Now no battle. Now he has destroyed all the idolatries in the land. But in chapter 16, he failed to rely on the God of Israel. And the seer came to him 
and rebuke him. Are there not many Christians today that they cannot be rebuked by their leaders? A little rebuke, they take offense. A little rebuke, they kick back. That was what King Asia did here. The seer came. The, word, the prophet of God came to and warned him and rebuked him. But what did he do? Look at what he did. In verse, in, let, let's, look at, let's look at verse 10. Then Asia was swart with the seer. Do you see that? Do you see that? Are you like King Asia? When leaders rebuke you, you, became, you become angry. You are wrought with the leaders. You don't see eye to eye with the leader. You can't take to correction. That was what he did here. He was wrought with the seer and put him, he even put him in prison. Today, you don't put your leaders in prison, but your attitude shows that your leader is in the prison of your life. Your attitude. So, he put him in prison. For it was wage with him because of this thing. And not only that, and Asia oppressed some of the people at the same time. Not only did he do it to the leader, he also oppressed the people. The people he was supposed to lead. He oppressed them. He afflicted them. But look at the end of this man. And Asia in his 30 and 9 years of his reign was diseased in his faith until his disease was exceedingly great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord but to the physician. Beware. Beware so that you don't become like Asia. Chapter 26. A righteous man but at this time he fell and he died and you know a terrible death. A terrible death. There was a man that was prospered by God. There was a man that the Lord favored him. There was a man, you know, that he was encouraged by the word of God and he destroyed the idols. A righteous king. But the end of his life did not justify the beginning, the good beginning he had with the Lord. Take heed to yourself. The watchfulness of the right. We, you know, the righteous, we have witness. Don't think you are a superwoman being. You are not a superwoman being. Get that into your brain. That you are born again does not make you a superwoman be more than the drunkard on the street there, more than the prostitute on the street there, more than the you know the the robbers, the thieves in the prison yard there. The only thing that distincts you from them is the grace of God. And I've told you that that grace of God is the thin rope that you need to take in. The weakness of the righteous. Second Chronicles chapter twenty six. There's another righteous man that started with, the right, with righteousness. Second Chronicles chapter 26, the example of King Uzziah. In verse 5, And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, what happened? God made him to prosper. You will prosper. I say you will prosper, but it is on the condition that you seek the Lord. You seek the Lord. You know, it was on that condition the Lord made King Uzziah to prosper. In verse 10, in verse 10, look at verse 10, in verse 10, in verse 7 rather, and God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelled in Gobiel and the Moninims. In verse 10, in verse 10 now, and he built towers in the desert and dig many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plain. Husband men also, and vain dressers in the mountains and in, the, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. He loved husbandry. Verse 12. Let's see verse, uh, verse 15 now. Let's start from verse 15 now. And he made in Jerusalem engines. He was even an engineer. Look at the wisdom God gave to this man. King Uzziah, he was an engineer. He made 
image images invented by corny men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with her, and his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. Are there no people here today? That the Lord has marvelously helped them that they are now strong. While others are still struggling in the UK, God has marvelously helped you that you are now strong. While others are still struggling to find their feet, God has marvelously helped you that you are now strong. But look at verse 16. But when it was strong, what happened? What happened? His heart was lifted up. Are you like that? Are you like that? You have degrees now. When you didn't have degrees before, you are so humble. You are so gentle. You are so lonely. Humble in heart. But now you have degrees. But now you have scholarships. But now you are now in the UK. But now you have a job. But now you have a family. Is your heart lifted up? Is your heart lifted, it lifted up? That was King Uzziah there. His heart was lifted up. Beware of pride. Don't allow pride into your life. His heart was lifted up. He allowed pride into his heart. And the Bible says his heart was lifted up to his destructions. Do you know, when your heart is lifted up, number one, there will be destructions. If you allow pride into your heart, there will be destructions. Number two, if your heart is lifted up, number two, there will be devastation. You see that in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 14. Number three, if your heart is lifted up, there will be downfall. You see that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 10. If your heart is lifted, you allow pride. You that before, we can talk to you. You that before, you know, you are so humble. You that before, you so love the Lord. You so love His service. You so love His world. Now you have the riches. Now you have everything. Now, you know, it's like everything is going well for you. If your heart is lifted up, there will be displeasure from God. Number four. You see that in Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 25. Number five. If your heart is lifted up, there will be defeat. You see that in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 2 and 4. If your heart is lifted up, number 6, there will be detriment. You see that in Daniel chapter 5, verse 20. And lastly, if your heart is lifted up, there will be damnation. That's why we need to take it, brethren. The weakness of the righteous. Righteous, we are weak. Without the grace of God, we are nothing. That's why we need to take heed. The righteous people. He was a man, King Uzziah. Look at him. He was Uzziah. In fact, he became the king of Israel when he was 16 years old. One of the youngest kings in Israel. 16 years old. And he started where? He started where? He started where? He started where? He started in righteousness. In fact, the Lord said, the Lord helped him. The Lord helped him. But eventually his heart became lifted up. And how did this man die? He died a terrible death. He, he died. You know, he began to take the things of he wanted to take the things of God for granted. He now thought that because he's not a king, nobody can talk to him. He's not a king, nobody can rebuke him, nobody can you know withstand him. He now went, he wanted to offer sacrifice to the Lord. And the prophet met him and said, Oh, king, you cannot do that. It is not in your ministry. It is not in your context to offer sacrifice as a king. And he was what? But do you know how he died? He died a leopard. Be careful. The weakness of the righteous. The weakness of the righteous. In Second Samuel chapter 11, we see the story of David there. 
David, the Bible says, he was a man after God's heart. David was a man after God's heart. But the time came to the life of this man David in his life. He was careless. He allowed a moment of carelessness. You see, when, you see that when, when people are going for war, like yesterday we went for evangelism, when we did our dawn day. Our dawn day is the time of activity. When the church is active, and you, you are a Christian, you are born again, you are not active with this church. At that time you say, oh, that's the time I have to do one or two things, and you go your own way. That is the time you need to be careful. That was what happened to David. When men went to war, David was careless, was, you know, was, you know, indulgent in his own house. And he went into the, into the scene of adultery. And do you know, that scene that David committed then, the house of Israel that's still suffering of that scene till today. Be careful. Sin has consequences. Be careful. Beware of sin. The weakness of the righteous what are these weakness of the righteous? So that you can look at them in your life and you begin to take care. So that you don't allow these into your life. Number one, iniquity. Iniquity. The weakness of the righteous. Iniquity. That you are born again does not take sin away from you. What do I mean by that? That does not mean that you are not, you are not free from sin. What I mean by that, that, that you are born again, let me put it this way, that you are born again does not immune you from sin. Do you get that? Hello? Do you get that? Does not immune you from sin. Do you know, even our Lord Jesus Christ, the one born without sin, he was not even immune from sin because Satan still came to him and tempt him, and say, if that be the Son of God, turn this stone, I know you are hungry now, to become bread, cast thyself down from the tower, from the tower there, bow down to me and worship me. Does not immune him from sin, that you are born again. The weakness of the righteous is a liquid sin. Psalm 51, verse 2 and 3, In sin did my mother conceive me. We are born in sin. That you are born again does not mean you from sin. You are not supernatural. Don't say, oh, sin cannot come near me. Who say that? If sin can come near Jesus, if sin can come near Noah, we've read that a man, God has not declared you righteous. So. I've not heard it from God that, ah, God, uh, 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 Pastor Israel, I declare him to, if God wants to even say that, I will just tell God, God, please don't say it. Because I remember Job. I remember Job. Job was not there when God was declaring righteous. And God was telling Job, was telling Satan, did you see my servant Job? That he was right. If God wants to, if God wants to boast of me before Satan, we just beg and say, God, please, I am still in this war. Because Satan is the God of this war. But he that is greater in me, is, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Noah was declared to be righteous by God, and yet Noah was a drunkard. The weakness of the righteous, number one, iniquity. Number two, idolatry. Idols. Look at Gideon. A righteous, look at Gideon, a man that God picked, a man that, you know, he, even vis he got the visit of an angel and said, go in this night. How many of you have had the supernatural being visiting you? Go in this, and yet, that man became an idol worshiper. Beware of sin, the weakness of the righteous. You know, people thought that, oh, until you carve an image somewhere that you have an idol, that could not be an idol. I mean, that's not the only idol. 
Do you know that money is an idol? When all your mind, everything you concentrate on now is on money. That's an idol. Do you know that you can make your profession, your degree an idol? When you bring that degree now before God, that's an idol. Do you know that you can make your career an idol? When you bring your career before God, that's an idol. Do you know that you can make your husband an idol? When you bring your husband before God, that's an idol. Do you know that you can make your wife an idol? When you bring your wife before God, when your wife tells you and says, ah, uh, <laughs> this uh, deeper life thing, <laughs> it's like, uh, Pastor, uh, dear, I'm tired of this deeper life thing. I want to go to where it's happening. I said, well, Pastor, you know that's a decision. You know, Pastor, I cannot force her. And you, the husband, you also join her. And you are going together. Now your wife is an idol. That's an idol. When you cannot take the stand and say, woman, before I marry you, I've been in this church. If, if there is anything that will come between me, between me and you, is this thing called God. Because before I married you, I've known God. I've been born again. And now if you want to take me away from my service of the Lord, it cannot happen in this family. Just know that from that day, from that day, the Bible says, uh, what God has joined together, let no man put that. This one is no man now. It's the word of God. Just know that from that day, we are now asunder. That we cannot be husband and wife again. Yes, you will still be in the same house. Yes, we will still, we'll still, we'll, you will still be, I'm not driving you out, I'm, but just know that spiritually we are separated. That's what it takes to be a Christian. Do you hear me? That's what it takes to be a Christian. That when your children are making you to lose your service for the Lord, you now love the children more than God. And you now be quoting to us the Bible and say, Pastor, didn't the Bible say, he that cannot take care of his house? Yes, he that cannot take care of his house, not at the detriment of the things of God. Get that straight. Not at the detriment when you now love them more than God. That is an idol. The weakness of the righteous. Number three, ignorance. Ignorance. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. That's why I'm pleading with us. Study the Bible. Many Christians are ignorant today because they don't take time to read the Word of God. They don't take time to study the Bible. Many of us, what we have, we just say, you know, I remember when I got converted in the 80s, we have what we call the, the New Convert Bible. Do you know the New Convert Bible? Okay? Does the normal Bible, the Bible without chain reference. The Bible that has nothing to point to you and say, oh, uh, when you read John chapter 3, verse 6, the, another parallel passage of John chapter 3, verse 6 is in Romans chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. You know, when you don't have a Bible that has those kind of chain reference Bible, like this one I'm holding now, you don't have Bibles like this, and you are born again three years ago. You are born again four years ago. What are you doing with your money? When we got born again, we invested our life. We invested our money. I got scholarship there. Everything, all the Bibles, most of my Bibles I bought then. I bought them when I got converted. Read the Bible. You mark the Bible. You, die, you go in, write a lot of notes on your Bible. Today, I've told us you have all these things on the internet now. Get those matters, the Bible commentaries, the share reference Bibles, the thing, get them, read them, study. Because one of the weaknesses of the righteous is ignorance. Ignorance. That's why many people have gone into erroneous doctrines. Many people have gone after false teachers. They cannot even distinguish. I remember one time there was a brother, you know, you know that was talking about one uh, false, and I've read a lot about that man. I knew that he was a false teacher. I told my brother, that I said, my brother, you cannot be promoting this man because he's a false teacher. Now, if you don't know, as a, as a Christian, you don't know all these things. You just look at all the things and you think, oh, because they are carrying the Bible, because they are preaching. You think that everybody that preaches is a, is a genuine preacher? No. 
That's why we need to study. Don't be ignorant. Because one of the weakness of the righteous is ignorant. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Don't be destroyed. Tell your neighbor, I will not be destroyed. Another weakness is idleness. 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 You see that in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 18. We cannot be idle. We cannot be idle. I've told you the example of, of uh, Samuel. Uh, I mean of um, David. It was when he was, in, in, when he was idle, he fell into the sin of adultery. Another weakness is infidelity, immorality. See that in the life of Samson. Weakness of the righteous. Number six, implacable. When you become haughty, when you become proud, you cannot be corrected. That's the weakness of the righteous. Number seven, illusion. When my people, there is no open vision. You don't have the vision of God again. You don't have God ministering to you again. Number point two, quickly before we pray, warnings for the righteous. Warnings for the righteous. Warning. There's nothing like internal or unconditional security. There's nothing like that in the Bible. We more, there's a possibility of departing from the faith. That's why we need to be strong today. And the Lord himself will keep us to the end in Jesus' name. Why are we warm in the Bible? We are warm so that we can be wise unto salvation. So that we can be wise. That's why we are wise. We are being warned so that we will not depart from the faith. Once delivered unto the saints. Number two, we are warned so that we can walk uprightly before the Lord. Walk uprightly before the Lord. Number three, we are warned so that we can walk our garment and keep them clean. Keep them clean. Keep them clean. That's why we are warned in the Bible. We are warned, number four, so that we can wage war against the flesh and the devil. That's why we are warned in the Bible. Warned. We are warned, number six, so that we can be watchful. So that we can be watchful and we stand against the enemy. And lastly, we are warned so that we can win the crown at the end of the Christian race. That's why we are warned. And I pray you will take it to the warning in Jesus' name. Remember, there is nothing like internal security. There is nothing like unconditional security. There is nothing like when I'm born again, I am born again forever. No. The soul that sinned, God himself says, shall die. In Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 20, the Lord himself said, when the righteous man sinned, the righteous, the righteousness of the righteous will not be remembered on the day when he goes in to sin. That's why we are warned. So that we can walk upright with our God. And we are going to walk upright with God. I say we are going to walk upright with God. This leads us to point three quickly before we pray. The warfare of the righteous. The warfare of the righteous. As righteous, we are faced with a battle. We are faced with warfare. We are faced as Christians. The devil is battling for your soul. The devil is battling for your life. And he wants to take away that spiritual grace, that spiritual vigor, that thing that you have in you. He wants to take it away. But the Lord will not allow it to happen in Jesus' name. I've told us already, the flesh will always fight against the spirit. That's why we need to stand. That's why we need to hold on to the Lord. That's why we need to watch, watch, watch and pray. Watch and pray. In Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, I'll read verse 36 there of Luke chapter 21. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. You will stand. I say you will stand. I say you will stand. No matter the battle, no matter the devil's you know, uh, arrows that the enemy is throwing against you, you will stand. You will not end this Christian race you know, halfway. You will make it to the end in Jesus' name. But then if we must watch, if we must pray, if we must make it, we need to watch. We need to stand. We need to take heed. Like, you know, like uh, this songwriter Elio told us, Christian, seek not yet we pull. Yea, the guardian angel said, Thou art in the midst of foes. Wash and pray. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayers. That the Lord will help us. We will watch and pray. We will watch and pray. We will seek the Lord. We will seek his face. 
His grace will be sufficient for you, my brother. Watch and pray. Watch your character. Watch your habits. Watch your behavior. Watch your attitude. We've seen the weakness of the righteous. We've seen the warnings for the righteous. We've seen the warfare of the righteous. We're in the warfare, constant warfare. You want to tell the Lord that the Lord himself will help you. That the Lord himself will help you. You watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Christians, seek not your reproach. Yet the guardian angel say, Thou art in the midst of fools. Watch and pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.